Hi, and welcome to the Faith Family Church Podcast. For more information about our church and who we are, visit our website, ffcackworth.com. Enjoy the message, and thank you so much again for listening. Okay, so this morning, if you'll please turn in the book with me, we're going to jump right in. This is one of my favorite classes to teach. Uh, we're actually going to be double teaming this morning. Pastor and I are going to be like a good old fashioned wrestling tag team. We're going to tag each other in and tackle the big material in this. So hopefully we get a pin to the mat one, two, three at the end of this. I'm really, really excited about it. But uh, we're going to start on page one. And since this is a class setting, guess what that means? Class interaction. So we're not going to stand up here and just talk and y'all don't talk back. We're actually going to get to come down in the midst of you guys and answer questions. We're also going to get a chance to let you guys speak out on what we're talking about. So let me ask this very first question. Let's go. um, uh, Chloe, I think it's about 10 slides in. Let's go to the question, what is wholeness? Does anybody want to dare bravely answer that? What is wholeness? I heard completeness. What else? Mind, body, spirit healed. What else? All right. Family, marriage, relationships, everything like that, complete whole. Okay. What are some ways people try to find wholeness? Okay. Somebody pointed up and said we find it through God. Good. That should be the way we find it. What are some ways people, other than God, people try to fill their lives with wholeness? Substances. What else? Money. What else? Relationships. Inappropriate relationships. What else? Sport. Ooh, sports. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Don't you touch the Bulldogs. Don't you touch the Bulldogs (laughs) or the Falcons, whichever you prefer. Absolutely. What does it feel like when you are spiritually lacking or spiritually empty? Have it, has anybody ever, has anybody besides me ever felt that? Spiritually lacking, spiritually empty. What does it feel like? Horrible. What else? You have no connection with God. You feel like God's not speaking. What else? Just going through movements. There's no meaning behind what you're doing. You feel separated. All good answers, guys. Great. Now flip over to page three. As you can tell, after every section, there's a notes page because sometimes we may say something that's not on the paper that's that's being inspired by the Holy Spirit, or maybe some maybe you'll even hear God say something to you that is not being said. That's what that notes section is for. So please be, feel free to write down anything you see or anything you hear that uh, really speaks to you, so you can keep it for later. Uh, in the process of wholeness. We have to ask the question, why am I here? We have to ask the question, why am I here? And the, que- and the answer to that is in Genesis 1, 27 28, we were created to enjoy a personal relationship with God and to manage all of the rest of God's creation. If I may borrow that, please, sir. Thank you. We were, enjoy- we were created to enjoy a personal relationship with God and to be governing over all of God's creation. That's the reason God created us. God did not create us to be his chief creation stuffed in a plexiglass cabinet for all of other creation to look at and go, aww. God created you and me as the supreme creation in this world with with a uniqueness in that unlike animals, we have a spirit. Unlike animals have instincts, they have flesh, and they even have to a degree emotion, but the majority of animals operate based on their base nature. Human beings are the only creation in the world that are created with a spirit. In other words, we are the only creation in the world that lives for eternity. We're the only creation in the world that has a spiritual side to us, and therefore we have a crea- we have, we're the only creation in the world that has a turmoil on the inside of us of good versus evil. And because of that, we reflect God's very nature. That's why when the enemy attacks, he doesn't attack you based on, um, you know, based on the part of you that looks like God. He attacks you based on the other half of you which looks like the world that you're born into, your sinful nature. And in fact, let's move forward from that into what's the problem with being created in God's image? What's the problem of having a relationship with God? And the problem is, is that man has a natural desire and a tendency to be the boss and to ignore God's principles for living. And the Bible is very specific. It calls this attitude, it calls it sin. Sin uh, translated into several meanings, but one of my favorite meanings is think of a bullseye. How many of you went to the outdoor day yesterday and shot a gun? A few of you did? Okay, great. Picture a huge bullseye right behind me. Don't shoot. Picture a huge bullseye right behind me. And in the middle of that bullseye is where you're supposed to hit, right? You aim for the bullseye. 
Now, picture shooting and you miss. That's what sin is. You have, a, you have a pinpoint, God has a directive and a desire for you to fulfill, and you shoot and you miss, the Bible calls that sin. So anything other than what God has intended for you, the Bible deems that as sinful. So then if that's the problem and we have a sin nature, and the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then that means the solution is God himself came to earth as a man, Jesus, the Father, then the Son. The Son came and became a man like us, and Jesus' death on the cross was the only way to redeem us back to God and make us whole. A man could not do it because a man would be born in his sinful nature. God himself had to come in his holy state and be born of a virgin, and therefore he had no man DNA, no sinful nature he was born with. He was born strictly of God through a woman who was anointed and chosen by God to bear Jesus as a, as a, as a baby. Jesus grew up, lived a perfect life. The Bible says was tempted in every way we were, yet was without sin. Lived a perfect life, then offered up his life on a cross after going through an excruciating, bloody punishment, then offered his body on a cross with nails through his hands and feet, hung there six hours. At the sixth hour, right before he gave up his last breath, he said three powerful words, it is finished. And the Bible says when Jesus said that the atonement for sin the payment for sin, the wages of sin is death. That wage was completely paid in full with that last breath. And because of that, your sinful nature no longer dictates your life. Now God himself through the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus can dictate and rule your life. And you can say no to sin and you can say yes to Christ and you can live a life that is holy for the Bible says, be holy as I am holy. And this is what we talked about a couple weeks ago in Galatians 2.20 where Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Now Christ lives in me and Christ lives through me. So that's the solution. We had a problem. Jesus came and fulfilled the solution. But it's important that we move on from that, that salvation in itself is wholeness. Salvation should not be thought of as a one-time experience, but as a lifelong process of becoming complete and whole. In the Bible, the words saved, healed, and made whole are interchangeable. Salvation brings wholeness to a believer. So in the process of this, we have to understand that salvation is not that one moment where you said, Lord Jesus, come in and save me and become Lord of my life. Salvation is now an everyday decision. Paul said, I die daily. Paul said, I wake up and I put to death my sinful nature. I wake up and I say yes to Jesus every single day. That I don't live my life as, if, as in reflection. I don't live my life looking backwards. I don't, you, how many of you drive a car looking backwards? You're going to get in a wreck pretty quick. I drive my car facing forward. Every day, Lord, I choose to drive. Every day, I choose to make a decision. Every day, I choose to go forward in what you've called me to do. I don't look back and lean on that experience. I look forward into, God, where are you taking me? I look forward into what happens today and the next day and the next day. I look forward into what God has for me. So it's important that we recognize what salvation is and that salvation is wholeness. And salvation brings wholeness to a believer first in their mind. Amen. This is the enemy's playground. The enemy cannot read your thoughts. He can affect them. The enemy cannot attack you without God allowing, but he can speak. Can I tell you guys, let me give you a little tidbit about your enemy. He only has one weapon. That's all he's got. He just runs his mouth. That's all he's got. The other weapons, you give him. That's right. You give him authority to do whatever he wants to you if you start listening. You go to the Bible in the book of Genesis chapter 3, all the serpent did was start talking. That's all he did. He just started talking. Eve chose to make a decision. Adam chose to make a decision. So when you start hearing a voice that's not from God, you say what Jesus said. Get behind me. Get behind me. I'm not going to listen to a snake. And it takes a snake to make a prince feel like a worm. Let that sink in for a second. Paul says in Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know God's will for you, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So God wants to bring wholeness and perfection to your mind. Number two, God wants to bring perfection and wholeness to your body. The Bible says in James chapter 5 verse 15 that we can call for the elders of the church to lay hands on us and we will recover. It is not God's will for you to be sick. 
It is God's will for sickness to come and refine you and change you and train you to become more like him. But God never inflicts his children with, sit, with, sit, with sickness. God never inflicts the world with disease. God may allow it to happen to teach you something or allow it to come into your life for, for a refining purpose, but God's will is never that you're sick. Please hear me on that. God's will is that your faith and your relationship with him grows to a level where that sickness can be cursed in Jesus' name. That's what God intends. Number, the next one, God wants to bring wholeness and completion and perfection to your emotions. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man or woman be in Christ, they are new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. By the word new there, it means new. Brand new, change, different DNA, different outlook, different purpose, different everything. God does not want you to be the way you were before you got saved. God wants the way you think to change. God wants the way you feel to change. Let me give you a little heads up. Your feelings should never be a foundation. They will betray you like that. Because I don't always feel like praying. I don't always feel like praising. I don't always feel like making the right decision. I don't always feel like being a good parent. I don't always feel like being a good husband. I don't always feel like being a good human being sometimes. But I don't go by what I feel. I go by who he is. And if I go by who he is, I become a child of God. I become a son of God. And I live life that God intended me to live. Do not be fed off your emotions. Be fed off your relationship with him. Also, God's... Salvation and wholeness wants to change the afterlife for you. The Bible says in John 3, 16, that God loved you so much, he gave his only son for you, that if you choose to believe in him, you won't die for eternal eternity. You'll have everlasting life. When you accept salvation and live a life that reflects your salvation, heaven is your home. And you are a pilgrim walking through this world. I just finished a series with the young people called In, Not Of. We're walking through this life and we're in it, but we are not of it. Heaven is our new address. God is our new father. We have been changed and transformed into the likeness of Christ. And we should be aliens on, on a different planet. We should walk as if we don't belong here because we don't. We walk as if heaven is our home, God is our father, Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. And if you walk like that amongst this world, you will stand out. Because you're different. If you, don't, if you don't look different than the world, it's because you're too much like it. The next thing is God wants to completely bring restoreness and wholeness to your marriage. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, 32 through 33, husbands, I mean, excuse me, wives, submit to your husbands as, in, as is pleasing to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's saying the, that the, 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 the basis of a godly marriage is the husband and wife are in unity. The word submission there means helper. The word submission there means completion. The word submission there means just as I submit to Christ, I become complete in him. As I give my life to Christ on a daily basis, he completes me and I complete my, the work he's, he uh, has started in me. In the same essence, wives, when you submit to the authority of your husband, as God is now his authority, you complete him and the marriage becomes one. In the same way, husbands, she's completing you, so you be willing to give yourself for her as Christ gave himself for you. In other words, when she needs something, it's yes, ma'am. Happy wife, happy life. Unhappy wife, hide all the knives. Okay. <laughs> God wants to bring wholeness and perfection into your marriage, and thus he also wants to bring wholeness and perfection to your family. In the book of Acts chapter 16, verse 31, we, we see where the, whole, where the early church was gathering together, and they were completing each other and serving each other and helping each other. There was a unity and a connection amongst them. This is what God wants not only for your family at home, but for the family of the body of Christ. He wants unity, he wants completion, he wants wholeness in every aspect of it. And then finally, God wants to bring wholeness to every relationship you have. He wants to bring wholeness to every part of you. Paul, the, John writes in 1 John 1 and verse 7 that we are to build each other up, that we are to have a true relationship with each other, that we are to have a relationship that's based on Christ and not feeling, a relationship that's based on Christ and not history, a relationship that's based on Christ and not appearance or attraction, have an appearance based on Christ and not what's been done to each other or done around each other. But if it's based on Christ, it's holy and it's pure. And that should be in every relationship we have. Are your friendships defined by Christ or by something else? Is your relationship with, with coworkers defined by Christ or defined by something else? If it's not defined by Christ, it will lack something. If it's not defined by Christ, you will be missing something. 
If it's not defined by Christ, there will be something you can't put your finger on it, but it doesn't feel right because you become unequally yoked with someone that is not holy and is not based in Christ. Every relationship should be based in Christ. And as you can see at the bottom here on this page, repentance means changing your mind and heart. To be born again is the event that comes from that repentance. Salvation is the process of living a changed life. Wholeness is the end result of that salvation process, and that is wholeness in heaven. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life abundantly on this earth. I've come to give you wholeness now. I've come to give you wholeness every moment of every day. Not to be completed when you breathe your last breath and open your eyes and you're in heaven. You can be whole now. You can have wholeness in him right here and right now. That's his will for you. That's his desire for you. Wholeness is the journey of a lifestyle that is devoted to God and heartfelt obedience. It's called a lifestyle of worship. And with that, I'm going to now tag my tag team partner, and we're going to talk about the next section of this. Are you all having a good time so far? Amen. Pastor? Amen. <laughs> Take this, brother, would you? Okay. I appreciate you being patient here at Faith us to do different things it is uh you know to come in every week and do the same thing sometimes gets routine and boring and you get caught up in habit and so thank you we're on page five in your book this is our live stream class and for those that are new to our church and maybe our guest here today please know that this is a part of the ministry this is our core values we're trying to display to you as a as, as the ministry of this church and one of them in the wholeness part is a lifestyle of, of passionately committed to Jesus Christ. How many are passionate for the Lord? Are you passionate for Christ? You love him with all your heart? Is he part, first in your thoughts uh, when you get up in the morning and last on your thoughts maybe at night? I'd like to believe that's true with all of us, including myself. But there are times when I have to admit, honestly, that he's not the first thought that comes to my mind in the morning. He might not be the last thought on my mind when I go to bed, God forbid, but... You know, sometimes we, and we need to understand this is a lifestyle. So when we talk here today, you know, I was thinking about it years ago. I took a, an offering at a, at a church, and, and I remember I told everybody to stand up and stretch and just yawn a little bit because it was kind of a long service, and I could tell that it was going to be a hard time to pull up an offering. And I thought, you know, Lord, and it's not about, church isn't always just about going and giving offerings, but it's a part of my life. It's a part of my worship. And I remember I told everybody to stand and stretch, and I said, what I want you to do is reach deep within the pocket of the guy in front of you and give like you always wanted to give. Okay? Well, that didn't go over too well because I actually had people trying to do it. But no, I, I won't do that. But I wonder sometimes what inhibit us to our money. And, and, and money is a part, an important part of life. How many like money? Come on, there's nothing wrong with liking to have money and the ability to have it. You're not to love it, I understand. But whether you like it or not, money makes this world, go, world system go around. And you've got to have it to operate in this world system. And that doesn't mean that it needs the Lord over you and you don't need to be bound by it, okay? But if money, time, and ability were not an issue, what one thing would you try to accomplish with your life? Come on, I, I wonder. What, what thing, and then uh, what are some of the things... And this is something I want to hear from you. Give me some feedback. What are some of the things that you find in church? And I can give you a ton of them because the pastor, I've heard them through the years all my life. I've heard a variety of different reasons why we don't feel like we can give in church. And, and so any, any quick thoughts? Why, why don't you, uh, maybe you're our giver, but why have you seen people not give? Maybe you struggled with your giving for quite a while. Maybe you want to give insight real quickly. Just some quick thoughts. Anybody? That's huge. That's huge. John, thank you for that. It's huge. Learning to trust God. Brother David, you had one? They don't feel like you can afford to give. You ever been in that place? Come on. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. There are days, the pastor, man, for years, you know, giving faithfully, especially when things were hard, especially when the church wasn't able to pay me a salary and I was having to work jobs and everything else and running constantly. Yeah, I understand what it is. Here's some of the thoughts that I jotted down. I don't know if these are in your thoughts. I can't afford to give. I'm not sure is what John was saying. I'm not sure exactly what God expects of me in my giving. It's not convenient. Believe it or not, I've heard this that, well, you know, I give online or I I'm, I'm operate on my computer. So, you know, because you guys don't have giving online, that's not true. We do have giving online. So please be aware of that. But the bottom line is it's not convenient or uh, they're in, I'm in transition. We're, we're kind of moving. We're not sure 
you know, we're trying to save up some money because we've got to move and we've got to leave town. Uh, there are all kinds of things where I'm moving into town and I'm not ready to start giving, all those different things. Uh, I just don't think, or I, or I just didn't think about it. I forgot about it. How many ever forgot their tie that on? Okay, well, thank you for being honest. I, believe it or not, pastor has forgot his tithe at home. Sometimes we're forgetful. We're careless, okay? And God forbid we're careless, but the reality is there's a window of time. I believe today there's a window of opportunity here. Every service presents a window of opportunity. The Spirit of God is moving anew and afresh today, okay? And there's a window of opportunity to give and a window of opportunity to hold back. And so I just want to kind of take you again it's about being passionately committed to Jesus it is more of a lifestyle if you look at our mission on the back of the wall in the foyer there it says it's a lifestyle I'm, I'm teaching people training people to live a lifestyle that's irresistible okay it needs to be something and and I believe every believer can get there I'm convinced because God's word says it but seven keys we're going to look at seven key principles now these are not the only but there are seven key principles that will help you in your ability to give as a steward of God. First of all, and I wanted you to get that little square box to the right here. It says what it is. Stewardship is having an appropriate view of God and myself. Do you know who God really is and do you know who you are in Christ? If you really have an appropriate view, giving becomes nothing more than a form of worship. That's why it's under the life stream process of worship because to me, my giving has become a worshipful part of my life. I, I give with the intent in mind that God, I know I'm blessed and God, I'm praying that this will be a blessing as I give, as my sow my seed. The first thought we see is God owns everything. How many know that? Whether you're a believer or not, we don't want to admit that or not, but God has everything. The fullness of the world and everything there in it is his. Amen? I don't care what the devil's doing. I know the devil is supposed to be the Lord, and we understand the word of God even declares he's the Lord of this world right now, and we understand that because a lot of people are being tripped up by him. And, uh, but I am not of this world. Amen? And by faith, I can live in a world that I'm not of and yet still be very successful. Okay, and the first thought I need to understand in Scripture, uh, and let's just read it there. It's in that next square box. Word focus, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Bottom line is that we understand that I am not, not just my things and my possessions that I have, because, you know, I, I've, I'm a little bit different in my concept of a lot of people say, well, what you have is not yours. No, God gave you something. Even though it's ultimately his, God gave it to you. So now what are you going to do with it to steward it well? God gave you children. What are you going to do to raise those children in the admonition of the Lord? But they're your responsibility. God gave you a home. What do you do to take care of that home? God gave you a, a, a job and, and provision of life. So what do we do with this that God has given? Well, Second thought, God's work must be supported by God's people. I, I look at this in Malachi, the third chapter, and, I, and again, I, I want to be careful because I'm a New Testament believer, and I do believe that the Word of God supports itself through and through, and I will show you that even in the New Testament, God throws the idea of the tithe out to us through his son Jesus. When you're in trouble and you don't know what to believe and you struggle with thoughts and the intent of your heart, always look at the life of Christ. I would challenge you, if, if you ever struggle with any life decisions, go look at what Jesus did because he is my perfect example, okay? And so we find in Matthew, and this is not in your notes, but write it, Matthew 23, 23. Please write it down over here where you can put notes. Matthew 23, 23, you'll see that Jesus goes before the scribes and Pharisees and he's kind of uh, making uh, light of the, not making light, but he's, he's, he's emphasizing the fact that you guys are nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. You do all these things, including tithe. You do all these things that are so faithful, yet you don't do the most important thing, okay? And that is a, a, a love relationship with God, a, a relationship that's intimate with God, being passionately committed to him. But he does say something there. He said, tithes and all these things are things you ought to do. So tithing is 
a part of the new covenant as well as an old, okay? But, but it comes in a different light in the aspect that in what manner you give, it'll be given back to you. And so, and I, and I remind people today in, in the seed time and harvest thought, and I'm not here about giving, I, you know what? I'm going to say something with all the love in my heart. Whether you give to this church or not really doesn't matter to me. And, and that, that, what only matters to me is that you be obedient to the Father. And if this church is where God has planted you, then you must be faithful in your giving unto God. Not because pastor says so, but it's a, a part of my lifestyle. It's part of our life that we, the ministry of this church goes on because of people. Brother Kerry, you got a thought. Amen. And that, that's, uh, thank you for that, brother. That's powerful. And, you know, and, and I'm not to say anything other than I, I know Kerry speaks by experience, okay? And he's went from rags to riches basically only because of God's blessing because he knows what it is to sow as a good steward. You know, we are good stewards of what God has given, not just our time and our money. Money's important, but it's our time, our efforts, our talents, everything about us, Okay. But tithing is a part of it, and it's how the ministry works. You know, one thing I'll always say to this church, and I've, I've, I've begged of you since I've been your pastor, and I've struggled with some because we do other things for outreach ministries that are not really our church ministry. We have a yard sale that goes on through a children's ministry that we support. And it's in light of them, and so we try to do that in honor of them and for them. But the bottom line is this pastor has never been one to go out on the streets begging for bread. I don't want our church out there selling donuts on a street corner. I don't want our church going out there begging for bread. Why? Because my God's big enough to supply my needs. And all I need to do is find a prayer closet. And I, and I would say that if we personalize that in an individual way, I don't just go and petition people for my needs. I present my needs to the prayer closet with God. God, you know what I have need of before I even ask. So, Lord, I'm going to ask you. And if you want to use my brothers in church, great. If you want to use the businessman down the street, great. Whatever you want to do. But, God, I don't need to go petition them. You can bring them to me because I'm your child and I'm led by you. Okay? And so as a pastor, I don't ever want to lead our church to be out on the streets begging for bread because my God's big enough to supply my needs. But I will come to you and constantly challenge you to give as to what you feel like you can give, okay? And if you can't give, please don't be under pressure. Don't be under condemnation. The last thing pastor would want you to do is leave here under condemnation and think that you have to give, okay? You only have to give because God is dealing with your heart. And until God is able to deal with your heart and bring you to an understanding of giving, then I, I challenge you just... Do whatever you know to do, little by little, until you see the word of God become real to your heart. Now, believe me, I, I'm, I'm saying this carefulness because we're not a big church and we don't have a lot of finances, okay? We live from week to week, month to month, and God is blessing. And we're, I'll say this, we are a church out of debt and we'll always be out of debt, not because of my great leadership, but because of the great God that I serve, amen? And because God has given me men and women to serve on a board with me to help keep us under control and help us all focus for the one purpose, one purpose only for the glory of God. But, I, you know, and you don't hear a lot of pastors talk this way. Look, at, whether you tithe or not, I hope you'll still attend this church, okay? And I hope you'll keep coming and keep coming, and ultimately I'll let God deal with your heart. Because when he deals with your heart, then you'll be able to do it in the name of Jesus. You're not going to be able to give. I mean, if you're grudgingly hanging on to that thing, then your, your motives are wrong. You're in fear and doubt and worry. And it's, I'm just telling you, folks. God's word can only reproduce of its kind what it promised. If by faith you'll approach it that way. And again, I say to you, seed can only reproduce of its kind. If you're struggling financially, then I challenge you to give something to God financially. Don't just give your time. If you're struggling financially in life, I challenge you give something financially because a dollar can only reproduce a dollar. A seed, an apple seed can only reproduce an apple. An orange can only reproduce an orange. And so I'm just telling you, if, if you're lacking in anything, the strength of understanding seed, time, and harvest in your life, if you're struggling with sickness, then pray for those that are sick. 
In fact, I watched it happen this past week in my family, my own personal family, my mother-in-law's aunt is struggling with sickness. And Melanie went in and said, sweetie, you're going to have to pray for me because I'm not, my foot is hurt and I need healing in my foot. So you pray for me. I'll pray for you and together we'll see. And today we're seeing miracles happen in Aunt Sandra's life. Man, she's getting up out of that bed. The doctors, the doctors had no idea what to do with her. They were, they ran, they just, they basically came in the family and said, look, she's dying and we don't know what to do. They, they, the specialists, they even had special on her. And today she's up on the bed doing well and she's getting better day by day, day by day. And, and there was a breakthrough that Melanie had, and there was a breakthrough in our prayer team. Thank you, prayer team. There, I heard about the breakthrough. I had to leave early that day to go pick Melanie up at the airport, but I heard of the breakthrough that happened in our prayer team right here in this altar. And it's the same time that release became up there. So I'm telling you, folks, there's power in prayer, but you got to understand God's word, and you got to apply the principles of God's word. Amen. Apply the principles of God's word. I don't want to... I, I'm preaching here this morning. I'm, I'm a preacher, okay? Hold every person accountable. God holds every person accountable. For what? Only what you've been giving. Now, if you go to the story of the talents, think about the story of the talents. God was given one five, and he gave one two, and then he gave one one, okay? And the guy that had five did what? He doubles his. The guy that had two doubled his. And the guy that had one was in fear, couldn't operate, but he was in faith. He was in fear, and so he hid it so he wouldn't at least lose that one. But when the master came back, the master took the one and gave it to who? The guy that had the most. Why? Because he found that guy to be more faithful than all the others. Okay, and so God gives to those that are willing to steward his money and his time and his energy and his gifts well. He didn't give you a gift to just hide it. He gave you a gift to use it for his glory. Amen. Number four, God will, God will is that we give generously and wisely. Um, good soil. I'll say this to you. You don't plant soil, or you don't plant good seed in bad soil. I believe Faith Family Church is good soil because I know my heart and I know the hearts of the majority of the folks that are members of this church. They're wonderful, powerful men and women of God, loving God with all their heart and doing everything to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out into our community. I believe we are good soil to plant your finances in. So in turn, we can see our children and youth and elders blessed. And so we are seeing souls, seeing souls saved as well. So I want to encourage you, use, use, you know, be generous and wise and you're giving the scripture references there. You must, each of us, decide in your heart and, and to give, amen? And don't give reluctantly. Don't give reluctantly, but give with specifics, intent. I can give you testimony, many of you that have been givers. How many are, maybe I don't need to put you on the spot, but you, how many in your giving have seen God work some miracles? That's all I want to see. Look at all your miracles around you. So hold them up again. If, if God has worked miracles in your finances and you know it directly to him, look at that. So you that might be struggling, seek some of these out. Just ask them their testimony. Seek someone out and ask them their testimony. See what God is doing in their life. And I want to challenge you. Don't be afraid to give, but it must be from your heart. And as you give generously, in what measure you give, the Bible says, it will be given back to you. In what measure? What does that mean? In what amount? No, it's not in the amount, but it's in the heart and the intent of the amount that I give. Remember the widow lady? She gave more than everybody because she gave all that she had. Okay? It wasn't the biggest offering, but it was all that she had. God desires equal commitment, but not equal contribution. What that means is simply what I just said. He desires that us to equally be committed to the task you know my paycheck might not be as big as yours yours might not be as big as mine and it's not about the volume as far as you know it's the amount in my heart and what I give I, I love what brother Kerry said earlier do you think God can do better with 90 percent than a hundred than you can do with a hundred percent of your money and the bottom line is, wouldn't it be someday a wonderful blessing that, God, I could live on the 10% and give the 90 to you? I do, again, I, I keep telling you, hey, that's possible. Don't, you know, let 10% be a, a starting place for you, don't, but don't let it be a stopping place. Give, give liberally in what manner you give. 
I know in specific, I've watched businessmen that give big, their business just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's amazing. They give big to the church, they give big to the ministry, not just our church, but they give big to the ministry of the gospel, and their business just keeps growing and growing and growing. They can't even keep up with it. Amen. Praise the Lord. God's hold more responsible for those who give more, or given more. I'm sorry, not giving more, but have been given more. God keeps you. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's quite interesting. The story of the talents, again, the five made it to ten, and he ultimately ended up with eleven. The guy that had two had four, and the guy that had one lost it because he was not a good steward. He was not a wise steward. God blesses the giver proportionally in the measure that they give, okay? In whatever measure you give, it's been given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and literally running over. In my life, I have had so many countless times where I've seen the glory of God move in my personal life and personally directed to me in a way that God showed me it was all him and nothing I could do other than be obedient and faithful. And, and my wife, can you, I, I can tell you story after story after story of the very thing that God and personally lived through these things. And I've had people that were saved and I've had the unsaved give to me liberally. Not because of anything I ever put to, I never asked a one of them. Didn't even know the one. He was an unsaved businessman, didn't even know him. He sought me out because I was seeking God in the prayer closet. And I'm telling you, that's the way it operates. That's the way the kingdom of God operates. Page 9, he says, tithe, legacy, and mission. We tithe because we're leaving a legacy. The church that's come behind, I talked to you last week about covenant. And I hope you didn't quickly forget, but covenant was all about my covenant to the ministries of this church. So in turn, the generation behind me has something to operate with. Amen. And that I think of the story of David. David laid up powerful treasures for his son Solomon so he could build a temple that was second to none. Amen. But it was all of David's doing to lay up the treasures. It was all that generation ahead of us that lays up the treasures. It was all of those pastors that have gone before me to build this building and buy this property so in turn I can try to develop this property further so in turn the guys behind me will have something more to work with. Amen. And we keep it in a place where we keep it out of debt and for the glory of God the best that it can be. Amen. Praise the Lord. Tithing, legacy, and missions. We have missions to go into all this world. It's our responsibility, and we are doing. Now, here's how, and I'm going to ask our ushers to prepare themselves uh, for offering this morning. And if you're our guest this morning and you have an uh, 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 information card for us where on the back you'll see our Connect card there. You can write your information on the front, and then you can maybe ask us for prayer. Maybe you're struggling. You're looking for a church, or maybe you're struggling in other areas. You need prayer. We pray over these prayers every week, so you can drop that in the offering. But here's the way that you can give here at Faith Family Church financially. You can give in all kinds of ways uh, uh, service-wise. There's all kinds of ministry to serve in, but you can drop it in the offering bag that's about to come. You can leave it in the drop box, and we got a secure metal drop box in the back there. If for some reason you missed the offering and you want to drop it in the offering box back there, there's an offering box, a drop box right in the hallway there. You can log online and give online, or you can also mail it in. And you know what? I've seen it happen to this church since I've been here as a pastor. We've been getting offerings from Jacksonville, Florida, because somebody saw us online. We've been getting uh, from down here in South. Uh, a, a lady in a restaurant keeps sending us her tithes. I mean, she never once attended this church, but she met somebody of you, one of you, have ministered to her, and you blessed her with a, 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 a wonderful tip. And because of it, she began to ask questions. You talked to her about the Lord. She don't have a home church, so she tithes to us. It's amazing how God's doing things, folks. And, and so, and I've seen people give in the mail. And so I want to encourage you, get involved in giving financially because, again, it's a direct result of your heart. Are you passionate with God? It's a form of worship. And truly, I want to worship this morning with our giving. So I'm going to let, if we uh, could, just bow for a word of prayer. And then we're going to let our men take, and, and then we'll uh, move on from here, Brother David. Come back and take us on. We're going to move now into the next section, which is on um, page 10, and it's on Bible reading. This is 
a very, very deep passion of mine because I have a true heart for people to learn to love the Word of God. Amen. And it's something that really the majority of the body of Christ needs to get back to and recapture. Because if the world sees our love for the Word of God, they will look at the Word of God as more than book, paper, and ink. It's so important that we have a true, genuine love for God's Word. So let me, ask, let me open up and ask these opening questions, and please respond. Why do you think it's hard for people to read the Bible? I don't understand it. I don't understand it. What else? Okay, they don't, they, don't, they don't have a walk with Christ, so a lot of the words don't make sense to them. What else? I can't find time. I can't find time. What else? Okay, we have trouble digging deeper into the Word of God. We can't see beyond the surface ink of it. Very good. What is the primary intent of the Bible? To teach us. What else? To help us understand what it means to be saved. What else? Good. Good answers. All good answers. Has the Bible impacted and changed your life? If, if it has, then you're right in the boat with me. When it comes to the Bible, the, the main character of the Bible is God. You've heard the word history. Flip the emphasis a little bit. It's his story. It's his story. The world reflects him. The life of time reflects him. The Bible is so much about him. Every page in the Bible is about him. Every page is about the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. It's all reflecting the Godhead. It's his story. He is the main character of it. The scriptures are not meant to just be informational. They are formational. Amen. The Bible is the only book in the history of mankind and the only book on the face of the earth today that you don't read it. It reads you. It's the only book that does that. It's the only book that completely forms your life if you allow it to. We must form our lives around God's Word. You don't, you, don't adapt, you don't make God's Word adapt to your life. You adapt to the Word. You adapt to what God wants. You adapt to what God's Word says. You don't make God's Word adapt to you. This is the problem with what I love to call cultural Christians. Cultural Christians pick and choose the Bible to fit their daily needs. The Bible says you take the word of God and you apply it to your life and you use it as a filter. Whatever doesn't make it through, you don't drink it. Whatever You treat it as a coffee filter. You don't drink the grounds of the coffee. You don't drink the chemicals of the coffee. You drink what comes through the filter. In the same way, the word of God is a filter for your life. You put it in your life. It filters every aspect of your life. And what makes it through is what you drink. What doesn't make it through, you throw it in the trash. Amen? You adapt your life to it. You form your life to it. You don't use it at your convenience. You make it convenient to you. Amen? The Bible is mostly written in story form because God's a storyteller. The Bible says that God has a book for every one of us. That your life is a book in his hands and he penned every word in it. And the more you are like him, the more you will live out the pages of that book that is your life. The problem is when we try to grab the pen out of his hand and we try to rewrite our story. You can't write a story nearly as good as he can. He's the master storyteller. And if you don't believe me, read the Bible and read it as a story because that's the way it was intended to be read. The Bible is not intended to be read but eaten. I don't go looking in the Bible for something to preach. I don't go looking in the Bible for something to teach. I don't go looking in the Bible for something to fight with. I don't go looking in the Bible for something to defend. I go in the Bible looking for something to ingest to eat. And then if I eat it and it tastes good to me, I serve it to you. Because that's what God's designed it to be. It's daily bread. The Bible says give us today our daily bread. Because that's what it's designed for. So that being said, I'm going to show you probably the most practical and easiest way to read the Bible. How many are ready for this? I've taught our teenagers how to do this and I did a class for this at a conference where I taught them how to soap the Bible. Everybody say soap. S-O-A-P, soap. It's very important that you learn this principle because if you learn how to soap the Bible, it will radically change the way you read the Bible. So we're going to do something kind of fun. We're going to do a soap session right now. I need somebody, first, first book I hear, throw out a book of the Bible. Proverbs, nice. Pastor Donald, Proverbs has 31 chapters. Give me a number between 1 and 31. Chapter 8. Okay, chapter 8 has... 
Let's see here. It's a pretty long chapter. Chapter 8 has 36 verses. Let's see here. Brother Kevin in the back. Give me a book. Give me a ver- number between 1 and 38. 15. All right. Everybody, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 15. We're going to soap this passage of Scripture, Proverbs 8 and verse 15. Now, in order to read the Bible correctly, you need to read it in context. In other words, don't pick one Scripture and try to make it fit something. Read the Scripture in the context of the whole chapter and read the Scripture in the context of the verses around it. So we're actually going to start in verse 12, and I'm going to read through verse 16. Verse 12, I, wisdom, live together with good judgment. I know where to discover knowledge and discernment. All who fear the Lord hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption, and perverse speech. Common sense and success belong to me. Insight and strength are mine. Here's our scripture. Because of me, kings reign and rulers make just decrees. Rulers lead with my help and nobles make righteous judgments. I love all those who love me. Those who search will surely find me. Okay, so that's our passage. First thing in the soap message is the S, which stands for Scripture. Read a portion of Scripture and ask Holy Spirit to speak to you. I guarantee you, as the ground I'm standing on, He will never disappoint. He always speaks, every single time. Holy Spirit will cause a verse or two to grab your attention. Now copy that verse somewhere. Write it down in a journal. Write it down on your phone. Write it down uh, on the edges of the pages of the Bible if you have enough space. But copy that verse down somewhere. So we're going to take this passage right here. Next, after you read it and do all that, the Holy Spirit starts speaking, go to the observation. Somewhere in that passage, we started, we had verse 15, but somewhere in that passage, another verse may have hit you a little stronger. That's Holy Spirit saying, this is the one for you. That's Holy Spirit saying, this is what I'm trying to talk to you today. I'll tell you right now, the one, who's, the one that spoke to me uh, very, very prominently within that was verse 13. All those who fear the Lord hate evil. I hate pride, arrogance, corruption, and perverse speech. That verse hit me pretty hard. Because that, that's, the, that's the Father's heart saying, all those who fear me hate these things. They hate evil. Then after you observe it, we have to answer some questions. Observe the context and meaning of the passage and ask the questions. Who wrote it? Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Predominantly, who wrote the book of Proverbs? Solomon. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. Moses wrote one. I believe David wrote a couple of them. But Proverbs is predominantly from Solomon's handwriting. When was it written? Time of Solomon is somewhere between um, 950 and and, um, and, uh, 899 uh, B.C., David was ruler of Israel from about 1,000 B.C. to about 970, 965, somewhere around in there. Solomon became king after that. So we can only assume that Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs from about 965, 960 B.C. to 9, you know, 40, whatever, in that 30-year period that he was the king of Israel, 40-year king of Israel. So Solomon wrote it probably about that time frame. To whom was it written? Proverbs is written to a listener. Proverbs is written to someone who's hungry for wisdom, who's hungry for knowledge, who's hungry for life principles. So if you are hungry for wisdom, hungry for life principles, hungry to change your life on a daily basis, Proverbs was written to you. Okay? Why was it written? For that reason, to give you a life of wisdom, a life of knowledge, a life of good principles to live by. What's happening in the passage? Wisdom is talking. I, wisdom, remember that? Go back in verse 12. I, wisdom, live together with good judgment. I know where to discover knowledge and discernment. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. Holy Spirit is talking here. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead, so God is speaking here. And God says, I live together with good judgment. I know where to discover knowledge and discernment. All those who fear the Lord hate evil. They hate pride. They hate arrogance. They hate corruption and uh, perverse speech. Common sense and success belong to me, says the Lord. Insight and strength are mine, says the Lord. Because of me, kings reign. Because of me, that president's in office. Because of me, that king is on that throne. Because of me, that dictator's in place. I am sovereign. I rule all. Nothing happens except through my hand. And rulers make just decrees. So when a, when a decree is made and it is just, it is right, it is holy, it is faithful, it's in line with God's word, it's because of him. 
because those who fear the Lord act justly. This is observation. Final thing is write down what you observe. I just gave you all about three or four paragraphs of stuff to write down. Holy Spirit's talking here. Holy, wants, Holy Spirit wants me to hate what's evil and cling to what is good. Holy Spirit wants me to know that those who make decrees that are just belong to God. Holy Spirit wants me to know that if someone's in authority over me, that God allowed them to be in that place. Therefore, it's my duty to respect, honor, and pray for that person. Pastor David, you got all that off of one verse that has like eight words in it? Yeah, because Holy Spirit's speaking. That's what he does. It's the only book that does this. It's the only book that does this. Finally, I mean, excuse me, number three, application. Now, apply this. Write down a few thoughts on how you can apply what you've read and what you've observed into your life, and then how can I put this into practice? Okay, how can I put this into practice? Well, number one, the verse said in the context, I need to learn to hate what is evil. So, God, if I see something creeping into my life that is not like you and doesn't reflect your nature and is not good, then, Lord, Lord give me a true righteous hatred of that. Give me a true righteous hatred of impurity. Give me a true righteous hatred of false speaking. Give me a few righteous hatred of lying. Give me a few tri- fi- righteous hatred of being, um, you know, uh, rude or inconsiderate or anything that's evil, of corruption, of, of lying, of perverse speech, of pride. Ooh, pride. Ooh, 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 pride. Oh, the Lord hates that. Yeah, so give me a true hatred of that, Lord. Give me common sense, for you said common sense and success belong to you. So give me common sense and success so I can live among this world, which lacks a lot of common sense right now. Give me common sense that I can live among this world and reflect you in this world. And also, Lord, according to this application, God, help me to observe and know that those in authority, you put them there. I may not agree with my boss, but you put him there. I may not agree with my coworkers, but you put them there. I may not agree with my president, but you put him there. I may not agree with my Supreme Court, but you put them there. So, Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to pray. Because that's the last step, prayer. After you've, after you've learned the application, now, Lord, help me to apply it. Now, Lord, help me to do this. Guys, this takes anywhere from 10 to 15, 20 minutes a day. They say if a person spends 15 minutes with God a day, their life has changed. 15 minutes a day. Get up. Get your cup of coffee. 15 minutes with him. 15 minutes with him. Your life will change. You don't have time? You'll spend an hour on Facebook. You got about five or or six TV shows a week you watch. They all run between 30 and 45 minutes. You have time. Make time. You can't not have this in your life. Go a day without eating. You feel it. In your spirit, go a day without reading. You feel it. Amen? All my my teenagers are like, we're soaping again. We do this all the time. All right. And then moving on from that, now we're going to move into the worship point. It is so vital that we understand what true worship is to God. Because worship has been defined as so many things, but the true definition of worship, and worship team, y'all can make your way back to the stage. But the true definition of worship, Chloe, I'm going to need you to take the slides here. But worship has been defined as several things. Some people define it as a time on Sunday morning where we do music and sing. Worship has been defined a lot of times as um, a lot of dancing or maybe a lot of, you know, you know, fill in the blank, a lot of clapping, a lot of loud noises, a lot of whatever. But the Bible says truly that worship is a lifestyle that's devoted to God in heartfelt obedience. That to truly worship God means I have a life that reflects him, a life that lives for him. And we need to understand if something is holding you back from worshiping God in a deeper way, then that becomes an idol. And the Bible says you'll have no other gods before me. So if there's something that's holding you back, if there's something that's causing you not to give God your whole heart and give God your whole mind and give God your whole soul and your whole strength, then those hindrances need to be dealt with. Those hindrances need to be put away with. It's so important that we understand what worship truly is. For worship is a connecting point to the presence of God. I'm on page 15. Worship is a connecting point to the presence of God for us as individuals and for our church family. You can worship God individually, privately, and you can worship God publicly in a corporate setting because either way, you're choosing to open up your spirit and connect with God. I did a sermon a long time ago called The Gate of Heaven, and I talked about how the the heaven, when you become a Christian, heaven comes to live on the inside of you. And so when you worship God, you're opening the gate of your heart, and heaven is connecting from heaven to earth. 
And it's so important that we, uh, that we do that, that we have a connecting point with inside of us, that we don't shut the gate on our heart, but we connect with God through, um, through the Holy Spirit. Worship is surrender expressed. It's when we become aware of God's presence, surrender to it, and then express that surrender. That's one of the reasons why we put our hands up, because when you surrender, you put your hands up. But when we, when we lift our hands, we are saying, God, I surrender to you in this moment. I'm aware of your presence. I'm aware of what you're doing, and I choose to surrender to you in this moment. Number three, worship is sacrifice. What does your worship cost you? I talked to the teenagers about this on Wednesday. I said, if anybody gets up and says to you the Christian life doesn't cost you anything and it's easy and anybody can do it, they are lying. The Christian life is the most fulfilling life you can live, but I will tell you the truth. It is the hardest life you can live. And I will tell you the truth, it will cost you everything because it costs him everything. If your worship does not cost you something, it is not worship. One of my favorite things to say, if it means nothing to you, it means nothing to God. You need to feel like there's something being given out of you when you worship. You need to leave church every Sunday feeling, I gave something to him. I gave a part of me to him. I gave my voice to him. I gave my energy to him. I gave my time to him. I gave my finances to him. I leave going, I have given God worship this morning. If we do not feel that every day, not just on church, but every day, then we are not living a life of worship to God. It needs to cost us something. David said, I will not give God anything which costs me nothing. I will always give him something that costs me something. Number four, worship is transformational. When is the last time worshiping God changed your life? If you are not changed by day by day, your life is not worshiping God. Every day you should become more and more in the likeness of Christ. More and more the Holy Spirit should form you and transform you into his likeness. For my expression of worship should make me less self-aware and more God-aware. As I worship God, I should become less and less concerned with who I am and more and more concerned with who he is. As I worship God, I should become more and more aware of what God's trying to do in me and less and less aware of what am I doing for him. Because contrary to what most Christians believe, worship's not about us. Contrary to most of what the world believes, worship is not a style of music. Worship is a lifestyle yeah. that is given to God every day in heartfelt obedience. And worship is who we are in reflection and in reaction to who he is. And if our lives do not live like that, then we cannot call them worship. If our lives do not reflect him, if our lives do not show him for who he is in our lives, then it is not worship to God. This last thought that we have in the lesson is that a prayer, a prayer model you'll find on page 17. It's not the only way to pray, but it's a good way to pray. There's two thoughts that come from Romans 8th chapter, the 28th and 29th verse. First of all, we need to understand that God's going to work all things to the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. That's God's promise to you and I. But it comes through a life of prayer. We understand that if we enter his gates with thanksgiving, one of the best ways to communicate and, and to get into the presence of God is just praise Him. And that's what we do at soak services. We, we advertise once a month or once a quarter that we have soak services. And the soak service is nothing more than worship. We come in and worship and we just soak in the presence of God. Just like we're trying to encourage you to do now. We're closing out this service and, and, and we're going to come to close in a moment. But I just want you to soak in His presence because when you read the Word, you know, we've learned about reading, we've learned about giving, we've learned about a variety of different things today. One of the final things is in that prayer closet is the prayer time that we have with, one, with God. That we worship and we enter his gates with thanksgiving, we praise him. The, you know, the plan here laid out that, you know, what God has laid out for my life, the confidence that I have in his promises, God's plan for good and not evil in my life. Nothing can separate me. Aren't you glad for that promise? That nothing can separate you from that love. And it's calling upon your life. You'll find that in a time of, of, of prayer, a time of just soaking in his presence. And then you can go after that time and begin to petition. God, help me in my prayer life. God, strengthen me in my prayer life. Allow me to see, what, see myself through your eyes. One of the, 
the key truths that I pray that you'll get in your prayer time is you'll begin to see yourself as God sees you. Yes. As God has spoken to you about his life and his love for you. And then reveal his purpose and his plan in your life. How many know the purpose and plan for your life today? You find that in a prayer closet. You find that in a time of prayer, soaking in his presence. And then, God, I pray, Lord, that you shape me with your character, your strength, and the skills that you have through and in my life, that my life would be used for your glory. In order my thoughts, God. Order my thoughts. You know, I was, I want to challenge you this morning. No matter how long you live for the Lord, the devil's always going to try to infiltrate your thoughts. And there's been times even in service or even in my prayer time, the enemy tries to infiltrate my thoughts and he'll come in with just such foolish, angry, sometimes obscene thoughts. And I'm like, you know, God, where in the world? Why in the world would that come into my mind? And it's because the enemy of your soul is trying to keep you from that intimate time with God. And I want to encourage you folks to put that stuff, bring every thought captive to the obedience of God's word. If it's contrary to God's word, cast that thought down immediately. Know that that is not the Holy Spirit. Know that's not God. Know that's the enemy of your soul trying to infiltrate your time with God and disrupt you and interrupt you. And prayer is one of the most important parts of a Christian's life. Bible study and prayer. Bible study and prayer. Spending time in the presence of the Lord. And when we offer soak services, I encourage you to be a part of that. When we offer prayer times, Wednesday mornings we have prayer time here at church. For some of you, I know you can't make it because it's in the busy, uh, middle of the busy work day. Um, but please know that prayer is important. Wednesday night services are important. Um, Sundays are important. Why? Because it's a, one more opportunity for the Spirit of God to speak to you and speak to us. And we're going to close this out in prayer today. And just, uh, I'm going to ask David if he'll play that song once again and just soak for a little bit longer in his presence. And these altars are open. If you're our guest this morning and you don't know us, please know that we're open to praying for you. If you'd like us to pray and believe God for a need represented in your life, you need somebody to strengthen you with thoughts or a scripture, I remind you to come to the altar of God with the word of God. Come into his presence with the word of God and your thoughts and your heart and when you present the word of God present it you know I heard somebody the other day said they they went from praying the prayer of faith of sick over over a sick soul of a friend that there is that was sick to where they were now commanding the sickness in the name of Jesus be gone Amen. they crossed over from a place of asking and then they got into a place of knowing the will of God and the will of God is that their friend would be healed and made whole and so they took it from the perspective now I'm going to command that thing like God commanded that I'm going to command it in the name of Jesus to be gone that's just one example of strengthening your prayer life and understanding who you are in Christ thank you for listening to our Faith Family Church podcast we pray you were richly blessed and encouraged by what you heard if you would like to give to our church and ministries please visit our website, ffcackworth.com slash give. Thank you so much again for listening.